you brought your Bibles, please open them to the second chapter of the book of Genesis. You can find the book of Genesis. It's easy to locate. First book in the Bible, go to the second chapter. In just a few moments, we're going to read beginning in verse 18. But before I begin this new summer series, let me pause to thank God for the 252 people, 252 people who were baptized into Christ last weekend. On each of the seven campuses of the Oak Hills Church, people chose to demonstrate their faith in baptism. We give God all the glory. Amen. We give God the thanks. We give God the praise that he would choose to to call these people into his kingdom and that they would have the faith to demonstrate their faith in a public baptism. So, Lord, we, we want to say thank you. Thank you, Father, for these miracles of salvation. Thank you for the promise of eternal life. Thank you for the assurance of your grace. Please forgive our speaker, Father, for his sins are many. And help us to see just Christ today. And through Christ we pray. And all the church said, Amen. 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 If you were to Google the phrase, most sacred spots on earth, you'd be taken on a world tour. You'd see a picture and read about Ularo Cottage National Park in Australia. It's a flat top sandstone rock that stands about 1,100 feet in the air, six miles around. Then there is the Cenote Sagrado in Mexico, a sacred spring that was worshipped by the Mayans. They believed that the God of rain himself visited there once. Mount Sinai in Egypt makes the list, as does the Crater Lake of Oregon and Glastonbury Tour in England. Curiously, there's one place that does not make the list, at least on Google, but it certainly makes God's list. When he lists the most sacred spots on earth, he would include on it your home. That's right, the residence, where you live, that spot on earth where your children play and your parents visit and your dog slumbers. It's holy. It's sacred. And it's set apart for a special purpose. Let's begin, if you'd like to follow on the outline, talking about your holy home. Jesus ordained marriage as holy when he said, what God joined together, let not man separate. The apostle Paul continued this theme when he said, for the believing wife brings holiness to her marriage and the believing husband brings holiness to his marriage. Otherwise your children would not be holy, but now they're holy. The Hebrew writer agreed. He, he, he said, honor marriage and guard the, what's the word? Sacredness of sexual intimacy between wife and husband. Who would have imagined that the hallways, the bedrooms, the kitchen of your world would be seen as God as a holy spot? The word holy means set apart for a special work. God never set apart education is holy. The government is holy. The shopping mall is holy. But God sets apart the home is holy. Now, perhaps your family is a tribe of people full of kids and grandkids and grandparents. Maybe, maybe it's just you and your sweetheart. Maybe it's just you. Maybe it's an unpredictable assortment of siblings and stepbrothers and nieces and nephews and stepsisters. The population of the home may vary, but the promise of God is not that he can take that home and he can create holy moments within it. We need go no further than the second chapter of the Bible to see the emphasis that God places on the family. I'm reading from Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 25. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air, and he brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. <clears throat> and whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. 
So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman. And he brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now, by this point in the Genesis narrative, the creation story is in full bloom. And after each element of creation, of creation, God would declare a triumphant verdict. It is good. The light is good. The firmament is good. The daytime is good. The sea creatures are good. Everything is good. He even once added a superlative. This is very good. But then when God saw Adam... All alone. What did he say? No, that's, that's not good. That's not good. And so God was the one who noticed that it was not good that man be alone. It was not Adam who said, God, it's not good that I'm alone. Adam did not say, God, would you please consider causing me to fall into a deep sleep and I've got a good rib here you can put to use. Would you please consider forming a woman? Give me a, a, a partner, a person who is comparable to me, a counterpart to me. This was never in Adam's mind. Adam never had these thoughts. Everything began with God. And so we begin to see the holiness of this relationship. It was born in the mind of the almighty, ever-present, and loving God. How would we expect anything different? God himself is a mysterious union of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So man, made in God's image, would be made to experience a mysterious union of his own. And so what follows is one of the most humorous passages in the whole Bible. I'd like to call it the peculiar parade. God determined, I will make a helper comparable to him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him now this is surprising isn't it having acknowledged that adam needs a helper wouldn't we think that god would immediately create the helper wouldn't we think that god would immediately get about the task of creating the woman but before he does that he enlists adam in a unique assignment he says i want you to name all of the animals that i've created What a moment that must have been. And so here comes the zoo. Here comes all the animals. Adam says, oh, you look like a hippopotamus. And now that's a giraffe if I've ever seen one. Oh, I'm going to call you a monkey. Oh, a mosquito. I wish he had just slapped that one, don't you? Once and for all, done away with them. Must have been something to behold. But at the conclusion of this naming parade, the scripture says, but there was not found a helper comparable to him. And suddenly we realize there's more going on here than the distribution of name tags. Adam was given a chance to select a mate. And aren't we glad he found no one? Adam did not drool when he saw the elephant. His pulse did not quicken when he saw the hamster. He loved the song of the little bird, but he didn't want to wake up to the canary every day. There was still no helper 
just right for him. So this exercise was for Adam's benefit, not God's. The real purpose here is not just to name the animals, but to help Adam realize he needs a partner who's special, wonderfully unique to any creature that has yet to be made. And so we're about to meet that person. Here comes the perfect companion. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam. And he slept. He took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman. And he brought her to the man. There is so much to be gleaned from this passage. First, we see the power of a good nap. (laughs) Write it in the margin of your Bible. God does his best work in men when they are sound asleep. (laughs) The snores of a man are music in heaven. For this reason, today we designate the lazy boy as an altar of Christian service. Men, I urge each and every one of you before the end of this day to be obedient to this ministry of slumber. And all the men said, and all the women said, forget that. (laughs) When Adam awoke from his deep sleep, we do not know if he noticed the missing rib. We're not told if he had a scar in his side, but we are sure he had stars in his eyes. Adam said, now this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Loose translation, this is the one for me. Hubba, hubba, hubba. (laughs) She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. Adam did not have to be told that she was the one. He just knew. God brought her to Adam. The heavenly father did what fathers have done in weddings all over the world. On the arm of her heavenly father, the first bride walked the pine needle strewn path of the Garden of Eden. And God said, She's for you. The family was God's idea. The family was God's idea. Over the next few weeks, we're going to talk a lot about the family, but if we went no further than that one thought, we would have enough. The family, a relationship of humans who come together in a special arrangement under the protection of a holy covenant, a partnership between a man and a woman who stand in the presence of God and by the power of God make a declaration of loyalty and fidelity. This is God's idea. It's not Adam's idea. It's not Eve's idea. It's not the government's idea. It's not a society's idea. It's not the idea of a Supreme Court. It is the idea of our Supreme Being, the Almighty God. He created this idea. So Moses, who most believe to be the author of Genesis, could not resist the temptation here to do an application, to do some teaching. It's the first teaching in the Bible. Up until now, we've had narrative. We've had story. But here comes application. Moses, if he is the author, says, Therefore, let there be, and the old translation says, leaving and cleaving. Always liked that poetry. Let a man leave, let a woman cleave. Let there be a leaving, let there be a severing of the umbilical cord to mom and dad. Let each leave their homes, let them come together, and this beautiful Hebrew word is employed that means glue, glue. Let them be glued together to the point where you really can't tell where one starts and the other stops. They become one flesh. And so as we see in the book of Genesis, 
The family is a holy place. It's an idea of God in a place where God does his work. This is not an informal shacking up. It's not a drunken party at a Las Vegas wedding chapel. It's not a casual experiment to see if it works out. It's not a social arrangement. It's not a civil union. It's not a financial partnership. It's not a legal affiliation. It is a holy union. So holy that God on earth, Jesus, would remember this moment on earth and reflect on the Garden of Eden experience when he said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. For this reason, Jesus says, for what reason? For the reason that God did this. For the reason that this isn't a work of two humans, but this is a work of God. For this reason, we can dare to believe that something is going to happen when two people leave their homes and come together and a matrimonial miracle happens. God takes two people and he makes one. The one who turned water into wine at the wedding is the one who turns two people into one at every wedding since. We see two people up on the altar. God sees one. We hear a bride and a groom making the vows. God hears one voice. We see two people scooting down the aisle to climb in the car and go on the honeymoon. God sees one. One. He brings two people together. And he creates one. Full cycle, full circle. There was one Adam when God made Eve out of him. They were one. God made two. In marriage, God makes one again. It's a mystery. It's a miracle. And it's a work of God. Please, when you go home today, Regardless of the population of your home, regardless even of the happiness level in your home, would you open yourself to this idea that when you enter into that relationship of people that comprise your home, you have stepped into a sacred spot. This is a holy place. You'd be wise to remove your hat and bend your knees because God can do holy work even if the dishes have not been done. Even if the laundry is not finished, even if there's tension in that home, the almighty God, the God of the Garden of Eden is the God who lives today and let the devil himself hear these words. God is at work. And since your home is God's idea, and since your home is God's work, God can help restore life where there seems to be nothing but sadness. And the same God who blends the colors to make the most beautiful sunsets is the God who can blend human hearts to create a family of harmony. And the same God who walked through the storm on the Sea of Galilee is the same God who can walk into the stormy living room and bedroom and hallways of your house and create peace. You may see no hope, but since God is always a God of hope, then there is always hope. 
It just simply falls to you and me to invite God to do the work he so longs to do. And that is the same work he did in the Garden of Eden to build a bridge, to bring people together and create a home. Most people, when they think about a marriage, they see two people. They see a a he and they see a, there you go, a she. And that marriage is a relationship between the he and the she. And they come into this relationship with such high expectations. He says, she is going to satisfy me. She says, he is going to fulfill me. And they're so loaded with expectations that because of the weight of those expectations, disappointment and difficulty, perhaps even divorce, is inevitable. Because, please hear me, he cannot be everything to her. She cannot be everything to him. No human being, no human being can be everything to you. No human being can. No human being has ever been given the capacity nor the assignment of fulfilling another person. I know the love songs say differently. Oh, she completes me. Uh, He fulfills me. And from the heavens you can hear God say, hogwash. (laughs) It cannot happen. Husband, if you're counting on your wife to be everything to you, you're asking her to do too much. Wives, if you're counting on your husband to be everything to you, he will fail. He will disappoint you. The first marriage was not limited to two parties, but how many? I only hear a couple of responses. I really need a good one here. How many? Three. Who made Adam and Eve? Who brought them together? And with whom were Adam and Eve intimately connected? God made him. God made her. Before there was this and this, there was that and that. Right? So the strength of the home as modeled in the Garden of Eden is not here, but here. Let this be a dotted line. Let this one be solid. Let life come this way. Let there be forgiveness first from God to man, God to woman. Then there can be forgiveness between man and woman. Let the man and the woman know they are loved by God, cherished by God, chosen by God, indwelt by God, fulfilled by God, satisfied by God. And then that man and then that woman will be one good husband, one good wife. But if he expects her or she expects him to do what only God can do, then the cycle of disappointment is predictable. There will be a hardness of the heart. There will be disappointment and there will be sadness. Now, you can tell, I bet, that what is described in Genesis chapter 2 is very different than what's described in the movies and in society, right? Our understanding of the marriage goes contrary to the teaching of our culture. Society says that marriage is disposable and redefinable. God says marriage is holy and unchangeable. Society says marriage is good as long as love is present. And God says marriage is good as long as God is present. Society says marriage exists to make you happy. God says marriage exists to make you holy. The family is the work of God. When Deanlin and I were married, our friend Carl Cope helped officiate the service. Imagine our surprise when he opened his mouth and caused us to drop our jaws by saying, 
I know you asked me to marry you, but I cannot. And then he just let that settle in the church for a few moments. And then he smiled and said, but God can. Don't expect a pastor to marry you. In fact, it might be wise for us to not even say, I'm going to go get married. It would be wiser for us to say, oh God, would you unite our hearts? Would you create a miracle within us? Now, I hope your home is happy. If it is, I want you to know God can make it stronger. Maybe your home is sinking. I want you to know God can save it. Because God is the God of the home, there's never a time in which the home has no hope. If it's a holy work of God, right? If it's just left up to you and me, we'll run out of strength and solutions and wisdom. But our God can resurrect Jesus from the dead, and that same power is alive in you. And that power can resurrect hope where there has been no hope. Maybe you find this hard to believe. Maybe you think of your home with the dirty laundry and the unwashed dishes and the busy schedule, and it seems more battleground than it does holy ground. Maybe it is today, but I want you to have hope. I want you to know God has not given up. God has not walked away. For heaven's sake, he brought you here to remind you that the God of the Garden of Eden is the God alive today. And the one who gave life to the first marriage can give life to yours. And the one who created the first family can recreate yours. Let's give him a chance to work his miracle, shall we? And if you think you've missed the chance to have the fruits of a holy home, just remember that God made the first home out of a snoring husband and a piece of bone. Don't you think he can do something with yours? Heavenly Father, hear our prayers as we think about our homes. There are those in this prayer who who feel like their expectations for home have been lost in the quicksands of disappointment. And there are those who are absolutely without hope. There are those even right now who are separated from people they love. Father, we ask you to please speak to those hearts to speak to those whose expectations have not been met, whose disappointments are more numerous than their successes. Would you please, Father, come to those and bring hope. And then, Father, to those who feel like their marriages are healthy, help them to be activated even with a sense of investing more in their marriage so that holiness could happen, that your presence could be sensed and your work fulfilled. We thank you, Father. Through Jesus we pray. Amen.